Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Collier. I'm the Professional Development Program Manager at the Ontario Museum Association, and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, Virtual School Programming, Decision-Making for Small Museums. As an organization of provincial scope, the Ontario Museum Association recognizes that its members and community live and work on the lands and territories of Indigenous peoples. Toronto, where the OMA offices are located, is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and the Huron Wendat. Territory is part of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement and is also covered by the Toronto Purchase. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm participating today from Anishinaabe territory on land covered by Treaty 11. And as you participate today, we invite you to reflect on the land that you're on, who the traditional keepers of the land are and what the treaty relationship is, or if you are on unceded territory. And I wanna thank everybody for being here today. <clears throat> I hope that you're all ready for a great conversation. Today's webinar will be an hour and 15 minutes. We'll begin with some introductions and then we'll move into a discussion. Um, our Presenters, rather than, than sort of making presentations, our speakers will address a series of questions intended to help you think about um, what kind of information you need um, to decide whether virtual school programming is something that you want to undertake at your museum. So the topics that we discover, uh, that we cover this afternoon address many of the same questions that are on a worksheet that Christina has helped us to develop. Um, my colleague Christopher will share that in the chat shortly. And we hope that this worksheet is something that'll help you with your own planning and decision-making process um, today and, and in future. Um, there will then be an opportunity for questions and answers after the panel discussion, and I'll make some quick announcements following and we'll wrap up around 2.45. Um, if you would like to send a question to the speaker, simply type your message into the Q&A box that you can access at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to say hello to your colleagues on the call, you can chat with them using the chat feature, which you can also access at the bottom of your screen. I would encourage you to jump into the chat and introduce yourselves to each other, um, but make sure that you're sending your message to everyone and not just panelists and presenters. Um, my colleague Christopher is keeping an eye on the chat um, throughout the webinar. Um, there are automated captions available, um, which you can access by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this webinar and the recording and any slides and resources will be made available following um, the webinar. Um, that includes the worksheet that we'll be sharing um, during the webinar as well. So this is part of the Small Bites Initiative, um, which is an initiative of the OMA funded by the Department of Canadian Heritage. Um, with this initiative, the Ontario Museum Association is providing accessible, high quality online training opportunities to build the digital capacity and skills of Ontario's smaller and rural museums um, to increase accessibility to their collections through digital initiatives. And we look forward to sharing some more information about other upcoming webinars soon, so please stay tuned. Um, we started this series with a conversation about digital strategy, and we are continuing now with virtual school programming, as it's an area of digital programming that many museums embarked on during the pandemic due to necessity. But for those who didn't, um, and now that schools are back in person, um, there's a bit of an opportunity to step back and take a look at whether this is something that could be part of your museum's plans going forward. So we're really focusing on things to consider when deciding if this is the right direction for your museum to go. Um, we have two follow-up sessions planned with Christina in June, where she'll talk a little bit more about how to synchronous and synchronous rules. Um, so I think that lays out sort of how things are gonna work today. So I think we'll get started. I'm very pleased that we have three wonderful speakers with us today, and I will start by asking them to introduce themselves. Um, so I will ask Christina to start us off. Can you let us know who you are and what your experience with virtual school programs has been? So my name is Christina Sidorko. I am the Educational Program Coordinator for the Oil Museum of Canada National Historic Site located in Oil Springs, Ontario. We are a small rural museum um, in actually in an oil field um, where it all began back in 1858. Uh, during the pandemic, I was tasked by my curator to create something virtual. And I spent a couple of days panicking, going, what is virtual? How do I do it? 
Um, and I came up with a system that appealed to my background in education. So before I became a museum worker, I spent 15 years teaching high school in Lambton Kent District School Board. So I applied that knowledge with the cries from help that I heard from my colleagues to create a full digital package. So slides, videos, um, worksheets and rubrics um, that you could deliver asynchronously, which asynchronous means that it just lives on your website or I could deliver it live. So as a guest speaker in a classroom. And really we got our start, start with that um, and YouTube. And we have grown since then to create a full menu of opportunities that last year we delivered to over 5,000 students across Canada and North America. And that we continue to offer today um, uh, when I am not stuffy in the nose. So if you see me and I, and I take, I have a bit of a cold today and I've opted to keep my germs at home instead of at the museum. So uh, bear with me, but I will do my best to share all of my secrets with you today. Okay, thanks, Christina. Karen, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, I too am not at the museum where I work, which is the Canadian Canoe Museum here in Peterborough. But I'm also here in Peterborough, not too far away, uh, in Nogojuanong, as it's known in Anishinaabemowin, the local indigenous language. And we're here on Treaty 20 Mississauga territory, uh, the traditional territories covered by the Williams Treaty First Nations. Um, we steward a collection of over 600 watercraft from all around the world. About 30 to 40 percent of it is indigenous made and you could say that should say that all of it is indigenous inspired since that's the origins of our of canoe and kayak traditions uh are indigenous peoples uh so that territorial acknowledgement extends into all of the work that we do um in sharing the stories and cultures around the indigenous invention of the canoe um i have been with the museum for quite a long time. I started as a as a education animator, as we call them at the museum, a program facilitator part time, like 2008 or so, and have been in the sort of coordinator manager type positions uh, for the last 10 years. I'm currently director of programs. So that expands, it, it encompasses school programs, but also um, public programs as well, tours and visitor engagement and that sort of thing. Um, our virtual program uh, experience, my experience goes back to 2016 when we started doing virtual field trips for schools. So um, it was very different um, context than the pandemic motivation that a lot of people um, uh, were motivated by. Um, and so I really saw a shift in what our priorities were over, over that time period, starting in 2016 and up until now, have experimented a lot along the way uh, with what, what works best for us and what our priorities are. And I can look forward to, to bringing that forward with you today. Great, thank you. Would you like to go next? Sure. Hi there. I'm Michael Furtick. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the co-founder and director of innovation here at Taking It Global. Uh, we are a, a nonprofit charity based uh, in Toronto, um, and uh, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, including Mississaugas of the Credit, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples, and part of Treaty 13. Um, and I did mention in the chat, there's a resource called Whose Land that we've been working on building with two Indigenous partner organizations to kind of highlight and support land acknowledgements um, all across really across the world, we've got uh, many different regions covered there. So I'm happy to share that with you. Um, our organization has been around for 22 years and I actually co-founded it as a high school student in 1999, really looking at ways that we could leverage technology to make learning more engaging for students by connecting them to real world people and places. And we spent our first decade uh, globally working on the digital divide in, in Africa and um, in Southeast Asia and many other regions and UN policy. But over this last 10 years, we had the opportunity to help steward and grow a program called Connected North. And it was actually co-founded um, almost 10 years ago uh, through a partnership that was inspired by Governor General Mary Simon back when she was the head of the ITK um, and Cisco uh, Willa Black, who was the head of CSR at Cisco, where they piloted a concept 
of donating kind of a high-end video screen to a middle school, Aksarni Middle School in Iqaluit, Nunavut, and looking at how that live, you know, learning experience could grow student engagement. And as you may know, uh, in our in the Northern Territories in Canada, access to mental health services and and the opportunity students have to access the riches of institutions like many of yours are more limited because they they don't have they may not have those in their community. But obviously today with digital tools, uh, we can reach them. So we now work. Uh, we've grown that program since we took it over uh, as a charitable program to now serve uh, over 120 schools, every school in Nunavut, almost every school in the Yukon, and then many other uh, First Nations operated schools uh, in a number of provinces. And we work with over 300 content providers, uh, individual role models, artists, authors, experts. So I'm happy to share a bit of a, a kind of program perspective in terms of we play almost like an air traffic controller or concierge role in helping teachers in all these schools. You know, over 850 teachers this year book some of the amazing content that many of your organizations have to offer. And we've had the pleasure of working with Karen and the Canoe Museum before as a partner as well. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, thank you all for, for those introductions. And you definitely have some interesting and, and diverse viewpoints to bring forward and to share with participants. So I think we'll jump right in. And what we're going to do, as I mentioned, um, is basically kind of work through in a similar way to the resource that, sh that Chris um, shared in the chat with just some questions, um, starting, as we said, in the description of this webinar with why, and then um, going down from there and thinking about the sort of the practicalities and the promising practices that, uh, that you can consider when, when thinking about whether doing um, virtual school programming is uh, a good choice for your museum. So as I said, starting with why, I mean, that first question is, why do you want to do virtual school programming? So I guess my question for our speakers is, how does answering this question help you to plan your approach to virtual school, school programming? Why is starting with why um, an important question? Uh, for me personally, it was really a personal drive to get local content in local schools. Uh, but we are also a national historic site that deals with a very controversial resource. Uh, so we wanted to really, how do I get it into the local schools where our local schools are like, what is TDSB doing? And I'm like, why does everybody always want to go back to TDSB? But they wanted to see it proven. So in order to get local content in local schools, I went uh, virtual and offered the program to as wide a variety and made it accessible to as a wide a variety of teachers. Also, as a rural location, we really do have some barriers to access. It is expensive for schools to rent school buses to come to us. We are a 30 minute drive and a school bus is beyond the means for many schools and students to be able to afford to come on a field trip. So I wanted to get our content and our historical information and geologic information into the hands of as many people as possible to create an awareness and to create some discussion. So we offered that on our website, both asynchronous and synchronously, to deliver that content in a way that I knew would A, during the pandemic, assist teachers in a virtual format that they were unfamiliar with, that they were screaming for resources. So this filled that need. It was a way for us to give back to the community. And the community since that period of time has really bought into our programs uh, that we are now partners with our school boards uh, in delivering this content to a wide variety of students. And it's something a little bit different. If you can't physically visit us due to distance or expense, you can still get a museum experience or museum professional content at your home school or in your home, um, which was something that was really exciting to us to be that innovative. Um, and, and it's now we're, we're delivering content in Alberta, um, showing our, our neighbors that oil started here. <laughs> If I can't tease Alberta, I don't know who else can. <laughs> right on. Um, yeah, so why? I mean, I think it's a, it's a really crucial place to start this answering the question why. Um, I think, speaking for myself, I know that 
I don't know. I think programming people, I think we have a tendency to want to do everything. You know, we get really excited about any way you can share or connect or engage, you know, with your collection or your organization and you want to jump into everything. I always do. And in the pandemic, there was also just like, it seemed like everybody was doing virtual. And if you hadn't already done it, you were like behind the times, it's kind of a fear of missing out sort of thing. And I think there can be a really a reactive tendency sometimes when we jump into programming. And, and I always try to dial it back and figure out what that why is so that ultimately it's going to help. I mean, just like in museum programming as well, if you figure out what the real why is and you kind of have to dig under the the top layers of it it's going to help you narrow down what to do like on every level to the kind of content you're going to deliver um as you know christina explained um for her um and you know the delivery style even the technology you might use um your pricing everything and it's also going to give you a way of actually measuring whether you're successful or not because you know what you're trying to do um our museum our approach like it's really shifted over the years our why i mean when we began you know it's like our first initial why was you know a, a board member thought it was a great idea <laughs> you know and, and i wasn't like super on board with it at the time i'm a very sort of experiential educator it seemed you know, oh gosh, we're gonna stand there behind a screen and like talk, 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 instead of getting the kids to do. Took me a while to get on board with that. Um, so my personal why was how to create a meaningful, as experiential as possible, as hands-on as possible, um, virtual program for learners. Um, our organizational why beyond the board members, you know, getting a B in his bonnet, which was a great motivator as it turned out, um, was that we were the beginning, beginning of what our big move to a new location and a new build of our museum, which is opening next year at this point. So it's a very exciting time. And in 2016, 2015, we were just, you know, starting that process really. And there was a feeling that we need to raise our national and international profile and having virtual programming was was a seen as a way to do that you know in retrospect yes and no doing a bunch of field trips around the world to classrooms doesn't actually get the word out all that much to adults in those countries you know a kid goes to their field trip they don't necessarily super remember where they went and spread the word but it did raise, it was very effective in raising our profile in terms of being able to speak about what we were doing. Um, it's a very popular uh, idea, especially pre-pandemic when it seemed incredibly high tech and exciting and cutting edge to do a, a Zoom with people. Um, so that was our initial why. And then, you know, so different this year um, as it's more about having to, you know, provide a way to connect with teachers and, and provide that, that resource to teachers in as we come out of the COVID time um, and on a really kind of granular level, replace the revenue that we made with in-person programming. So very different kind of vibes, uh, depending on what we were trying to do and who we were trying to reach, which I think leads into the next uh, question. Uh, yeah, it, it, it certainly does in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, going going from that purpose to the to the specific audience that you're you're looking at, and I think you mm -hmm. both talk about both local audiences, and more either national or even international audiences. So, um, you know, depending on your target audience, how do you tailor your programming to that specific audience? <clears throat> um, yeah, maybe we can start with Christina again. So. Because the oil museum is a national historic site and it deals with oil, uh, we do really focus on what does this resource mean for the local population? So if I'm dealing with a local school, I there are shortcuts that I can use. Everybody in my community knows what it smells like. Um, whereas if I'm dealing with a more provincial audience, those who are outside of oil springs or petroleum, um, or oil city, then 
we have to change the, the language around talking about this resource. They don't have that tactile sensory experience of, oh, we go to school and every day we pass a pump jack. Um, that changes when I start talking to students who are interprovincial. So if I'm talking to students in Alberta, they think Alberta is where it all began and it's this economic powerhouse and we really have to ground, no, this is, this is history that started in Southwestern Ontario. This is history that continues to impact us today and continues to have this reach. The oil museums also got different goals for different groups. So we are making a UNESCO World Heritage bid. You know, we have ICOM coming to town in August. So we are really framing the conversation about how do you access and create these visual pictures and then relate it to personal experiences. Um, so oil is one of these things, you hear about it on the news. So what have you heard? And what myths can we dispel? And every opinion is correct and every viewpoint is correct. Somebody, how they view it in the North is very different than somebody in Toronto that walks everywhere than somebody that lives in rural Alberta. So these conversations are really part of the language that you use to structure your programs and the different goals you have when an audience, when you're doing your intake form for um, a virtual program, whether it's asynchronous or synchronous, you have to think about who is the end user and where is that end user and making sure that that end product answers all those questions, which may mean that there are on the back end of your program, a pile of additional information hyperlinks to provide that context um, or videos or extras so that you can give that full picture of what you're delivering mm -hmm. um, to that end user and thinking about okay, am I delivering this for teachers? Am I delivering this local? And really when you're delivering any education program, your made audience, while we think it's the students, it's not. It's the teacher that's buying the program. It's that person that you're selling it to and you have secondary audiences. And when you're going into people's homes, that student may be your primary focus, but grandma and mom, and brothers and sisters are also listening on it. So you are actually educating or informing a wide variety of people. And you'll notice that in your questions because you'll hear, pss, pss, pss. ask about this, why is gas so expensive? And you're like, that is not about simple machines. <laughs> but you have to be open to this wide variety of experiences. Yeah, I jump in to say that there are, for me, a kind of two levels of thinking about how we're serving the audience as well. So there's kind of, you know, as Christina was mentioning, you're finding out what, what needs do the teachers have, you're um, designing a program to meet those needs. So you have that, you know, you're, you're you know, for us, we sort of have landed on these kind of two, in terms of school programs, two basic kind of templates for our programs. It's not really quite the right word. We're two different virtual field trips that have sort of core content. One is around sort of fur trade era stuff, and collection and fur trade canoes, Voyager canoes, Voyager life. One is around uh, indigenous traditional watercraft. So when I take parts, different parts of the galleries, very different focus, different artifacts. From there, you know, as a sort of a program design to start with, I, I began with certain audiences for the, you know, what we call our bark skin and cedar. In terms of program design, that was for the grade three audience that was looking at uh, comparing different indigenous communities and um, ways of knowledge um, and, you know, some settler stuff being brought into that as well for the you know fur trade side of our galleries that program was designed around grade five five six and even seven eight curriculum broadly and but that said once we had that core then you know that was our main design on the front end of those programs but from there then we get to our kind of level of day-to-day you know, addressing our audience. And 
you know, we've learned after doing this for a bunch of years to extend that traditional indigenous watercraft program from like kindergarten up to college level um, and tweak it based on the curriculum connections, or even if it's an international audience, you know, you're not dealing with curriculum connections anymore, unless you've got a better memory than I do. <laughs> um, you're, you know, we end up focusing on calling, we just call it Canada by canoe, because that just makes everyone want to come from all around the world. And we explore much of the same content that way, but with fewer as Christina mentioned, fewer sort of geographical assumptions if you're, you know, on a virtual field, uh, field trip with someone in Sri Lanka. Um, so you have, uh, you know, your day-to-day -day tweaking. Um, one of the main things that we often do is um, we, you know, note where the community is and we find out what, what is their waterway or we make sure we ask that at the beginning of the program so that we are, if it's a fur trade program, we know if they're actually their town, which many are, are it was a fur trade post to start with, uh, or you know these little tweaks or what is their waterway? Have they been on a waterway and kind of get that personal connection there? Um, we work with Michael right now and the uh, coordinators with uh, Connected North to reach schools around the far north, and we. Uh, do the same thing with those those schools is we always check where the schools are, what the community is, you know, what the territory is, what connections a particular artifact that we may have has to that community specifically to try and create that personal connection. So, you know, it sounds like a lot, but once you have your basic kind of core program and you get pretty darn familiar with it, um, uh, finding those kind of community specifics it's it allows for a lot uh, better connection with the the kids that you're you're connect you're you're have your program with and it also makes it incredibly fresh every day i've found it incredibly enriching to realize <laughs> like how oh, no matter where i look like you'd think i would be all over this but it has been very nourishing to realize that connection that almost everybody every community we talk to has with water and has with some kind of canoe history because it's based on a, on the water's edge. And, and you may find that as you go forth with your programming that you, you find kind of a new, a, a new kind of take on, on your collection or your organization as you connect it with communities and schools all around the world. I just want to tag on to that. It's mm -hmm. really important that you understand educational curriculum because an educator will not book a program unless they can justify it from a curriculum standpoint. So you mm -hmm. should start there with mm -hmm. your planning. Just mm -hmm. it's bedtime reading because it will put you to sleep to read the Ontario <laughs> or the Alberta curriculum. And they're fairly similar throughout the country and in the United States. It's generally within a grade. But understand that first before you mm -hmm. start going, I'm going to create a program. Yes. Sorry, Michael, I cut mm -hmm. you off. No, that's okay. And actually, Daryl mm -hmm. had a question in the Q&A, almost asking exactly that around the mm -hmm. curriculum. One of the things that we've been doing this year, Daryl, is actually we hired several retired principals and educators to kind of comb through our catalog and look at, watch recordings, and then make those curriculum alignments for us. So that may mm -hmm. be an opportunity to look for an educator or a retired principal that you could reach out to that be interested in taking that on as a project and helping you map out those alignments, depending on whether your scope is national uh, or just here in Ontario but you know there's many opportunities to align to the curriculum and then we've actually built a search engine where teachers can go in and kind of search by the curriculum outcome they want to meet and then we have about 1600 sessions across the providers and that helps us guide them but I was just going to touch briefly on what Karen has already shared in terms of what we try to encourage our providers to do uh, which is exactly that kind of tailoring of programming, really understanding the community they're speaking to. All of our partner communities are remote communities with unique contexts. And then, and then looking at how you could incorporate interactivity to let students participate and share maybe first to see what they already know. Because as you touched on, there's many topics where, you know, there's many kind of histories and cultural significance of these items and students are eager to share what they know. So including interactivity and as much as possible doing a little bit of research first on the context you know, we've had speakers talking to students in, in Nunavut about, you know, the importance of eating like fresh fruits as nutrition. Well, that's maybe not accessible or 
even yeah. is relevant um, to the genetics of what they is necessary for Inuit for their diet. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, those kind of personalizations are important. And uh, we're, we're doing some work as a program to try to even support our providers in that next year. I've found working with the schools with Connected North in particular, mostly Indigenous schools, um, you know, we've always, you know, you always, it's really easy when you launch into a virtual program to be just like, bam, 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 here I go, I'm so excited. And learning to, to not do that, <laughs> to leave space, to be calm, um, and to establish that connection with the students to start with. And I have found, Michael, that it's like, exponentially even more true and we've been working with the classrooms that we've met through your organization um if we do not stop to make that connection and leave plenty of space um at the beginning you know people check out and it's been uh really eye-opening how crucial it's been in those schools and it sort of overflowed into all the rest of our program delivery actually and and you know we always knew that but it it has really uh, hit home uh, at connecting with the schools through your program. And everybody, no matter where they are, can relate to whatever topic you are discussing. You know, love it or hate it, people mm -hmm. love and hate oil, but we find a way to have civilized conversations and your audience, students, are far more intelligent and aware than what you often give them credit for. A grade three, knows what's going on in the world. Thank you. I think to uh, to come back a little bit to, to sort of connecting with target audiences, and as you mentioned, those audiences actually being teachers rather than students in many cases. Um, and we had a, a question um, in the Q&A already about sort of getting connected with school boards and, and who to speak to and how to do that. Um, do you have any any words of advice, I think, first for Christina and Karen about working with local teachers and school boards, and then um, Michael in terms of working with intermediary organizations that can, can connect you more. more so I'll jump in first. Uh, so my background is in education. So I had personal connections to the school board as I used to be a teacher for them. Sometimes you just have to pick up the phone and start cold, cold calling, mm -hmm. and you're not gonna call the supers. They're busy. You're going to call your local principal at your local school and they're going to put you in touch with your subject coordinators or your program leads. So these will be your outdoor education specialists. These will be your literacy specialists. You go in through these intermediaries, these, these middle guys in the board. You can also launch your programs on Facebook. Facebook and the professional organizations. So you're looking at the professional organizations such as OHASTA, which is the Ontario History and Social Science Teachers Association, OG, which is the Ontario Geography and Environmental Educators, uh, ETFO, OECTA. So you're gonna go after the professional organizations, but all of these guys have a Facebook page called resource sharing. Mm -hmm. um, generally, they're gonna require that you have a teaching license to log in. I got one, I'm not using it right now. So I just downloaded my number and they're like, yeah, you have an active license. You find a friend, a teacher friend, a mole, um, and say, do you want to just give a positive review? And teachers are chit-chatty gossips. If they find something and it worked and it was wonderful and it made their day easier or it lit a light bulb in some of those kids, they'll tell all their friends and they will share it and then you will go viral and then you have other issues to worry about such as overbooking. Um, every teacher wants next Tuesday at 9 a.m. and there's only one of you. So feel okay to say no um, and say, you can have the following Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, but yeah. I would recommend going after the professional organizations and you just, it takes work and it sometimes it's gonna take years. It took years for me to find the right person for the local school boards. Um, and, it, and it's about networking and plugging away and supers are busy, so they'll toss it off. And this principal hates field trips. So mm -hmm. go find yeah. a different principal. Yeah. Don't take no for an answer. No is yeah. just maybe tomorrow. <laughs> think One like thing, your four-year-old. Yeah. I think I'll point out 
I mean, my experience is much the same. I mean, it's true of in-person programs, it's true of virtual programs. So many of you have this experience already, I'm sure. Um, but uh, I mean, like this really good tip, connecting, getting connected with the program leads and uh, specialists inside the boards. One thing's really noticeable, I and mean, we've tried this a little bit, but you know, actual advertising, I think is a waste of time, honestly, in this in in school programs. I mean, maybe that's bold to say, but when we look at, I, I have a question on all our intake tape forms, whether it's virtual programs or in-person programs, and you know, how did you hear about this program and what's bringing you here? It is, and with our virtual programs, it is word of mouth. We came in person before, we've come before another teacher told me like that's and we do get a fair bit of web search as well so there's that but I've, I've never heard anyone answer that they saw us in this or that you know field trip guide publication that we paid to be in um so it is that i mean i think we know from all kinds of programming that it's it's teacher uh, teachers who are your ambassadors i've i've always thought you know if you can nurture that relationship with a teacher in a school they are going to spread it around their school and if they go to another school eventually they're going to spread it around there and we see that kind of leapfrogging type of booking happening by far the most so develop your relationships with teachers and I guess I would turn it over to Michael um, I will just say that when we started programming doing virtual programs we actually were on what was then called the Microsoft Educator Network or Skype in the Classroom that we were invited to be on. And that was basically kind of with another form of intermediate organization. They were kind of, or they really just hosted our profile, honestly. It took me a while to realize that. But anyway, and then so, so teachers could book through that portal. And it basically meant I didn't do it wasn't even on our website. Um, Christina alluded to this. You you will run into capacity issues. Like if you are the same people delivering your in-person programming and your virtual programming, you know, or in our case right now, our museum isn't open all the days of the week, but the, we're also preparing our collection for the move. So we don't have like a wide open schedule to do these. So we don't have tons of availability. So we've like never had to promote and you may find the same thing it's um if once your word of mouth gets out there like you probably will if it's like christina and i you have more than you can actually say yes to um yeah. unless you and have a wildly large staff <laughs> and don't be afraid to mine your email data banks so mm -hmm. send out an e-blast with everybody that's booked and in person therefore they're open to taking on virtual um and, and facebook Teachers love Facebook um, and Instagram. Yeah, just a little bit about Connected North. So we're a little bit different in that we are both an intermediate organization, but then we also raise funding as a charity to cover all the costs for our schools. So with content providers, we work with a number of folks who operate on a cost recovery model, who you know set a fee that, that we raise money to pay. There's also some institutions that have money from external donors. Um, so they offer their funding for free. So we take care of both like the technical coordination and we actually have a team member sit in as tech support on every single one of the sessions as well. So if you can imagine this year over 5,000 sessions delivered across the schools, part of that is because in many of the regions we're working like in, in Nunavut, for example, it's still satellite only. So we actually have to book satellite time with the government of Nunavut for every single session. And there are things that can go wrong with that. So being having someone available to kind of support the teacher and scheduling and delivering it is really important. Um, but yeah, we, we do as a program have a network of providers. We have a, a form on our website. I can put it in the chat and we would welcome uh, anyone interested in joining that community. Uh, and sharing content. One of the primary focuses of our program is increasing representation of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis role models in the classroom. So um, we're particularly looking for institutions or organizations that have that sort of Indigenous representation on staff because our community partners, our school partners, you know, we got this beautiful, uh, we're doing a student survey right now and one student said, you know, I believe anything is possible. That representation for students to see themselves uh, in any career path or, in, uh, you know, and see themselves in history as well represented is really important. And so that's a primary focus of the program is growing um, representation and content. And about 40% of our sessions right now almost are, are delivered by Indigenous um, content providers. 
I'll jump in to say that it's a really amazing working. I've had experience of working with Connected North for about, I don't know, 18 months now or so, coming into 2020. And it's it's really uh, amazing. They they provide the scheduling and we'll get into that a little bit later down to connect you with the schools. So it's as simple as, yes, we can do that time. And then like <laughs> they take care of everything else and are there to facilitate the technology. It's it's just dreamy. Like, Michael, if you need oil programs, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, we'd love to chat about that. One of the things, just as an example, is just the invoicing and administration process can be a lot for a school district, for example. They have lots of sometimes bureaucracy or challenges with payments. And so we built a system where we actually generate the invoices on behalf of our providers and pay them. So it's, it's a, you know, a within 24 hour to 48 hour turnaround. So the logistics around sometimes for a school board, managing that administrating that funding can be challenging too so thinking about you know how you can make the process as painless as possible for them and being creative sometimes around that like if people can pay on a credit card sometimes it's faster to get paid that way because they don't have to go through another like purchase order process but that's a whole other topic and question <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll get we'll get a little bit to the the revenue side of things um a little bit later but thank you for that and i think um, what what Michael's talking about in terms of Connected North, I think going back to that why, if that why is connecting more broadly and into more remote communities, I think that's certainly a really interesting opportunity to look at. Um, I know at the very beginning, Christina mentioned very briefly the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. And I think I'm gonna ask you to, in like 10 seconds, tell us the difference. And then once, uh, <laughs> once we do that, we're gonna talk a little bit about the technical requirements. So what, what can you give us, Christina? Uh, here, let me share a slide. Uh, so, so an asynchronous program, very simply, an asynchronous program is a program that lives on your website. So it is able, a program. So these are what my asynchronous programs, they're very, very fancy slide decks. Teachers love slides. Um, it's a program, you build it, you put all of the content, I audio dub all of my content in French and in English to create better accessibility for students uh, for different reading levels. You're going to put all of your education, your content, your curriculum, and your worksheets, and you can put it all in there and it's, it's built and it's a package that you can just take and access. So when during the pandemic we had students learning asynchronously which meant that the teacher threw content in their google classroom or their seesaw account and they did it at their own pace this is a project or a program that a teacher can access and deliver to their classroom at their own pace or that students can access whether they are home learning at their own pace it is a complete package with everything so content and it's all chunked into a way. A synchronous program is basically a live program. That's a program that Karen and I might deliver from our respective locations where you are a guest speaker in somebody's classroom. So I am invited as a guest speaker. I have this wonderful little tech setup that you see here and I am with my slides and all of my on, on this, you can see all my oily artifacts. I, it's an oil museum. I love oily things. Um, so I will bring my samples and my artifacts, and I can then share those with a pre-fab program. So you are getting me physically, virtually, there to answer and deliver the whole program. So the teacher doesn't have to. It. The teacher is the moderator. The teacher is in charge of their classroom, and I am delivering the program in real time. Whereas an asynchronous, it lives on your website and you don't need staff to deliver the program. You need staff to create the program um, and then it's accessed asynchronously. Synchronous means I'm there as a real person delivering the content to you and you can ask questions and you can interact with me. So these are my little setups. And generally you will always see a tile depending on whether you're using Google, Microsoft or Zoom or any of the other different platforms that you are using. So I will stop share there. <laughs> Great. Thanks. I would just jump in to say, um, like we don't, 
Christina blows my mind with her, <laughs> all her asynchronous programs. We at the museum, we have not focused on asynchronous um, for a few quirky reasons. I will say that it's a brilliant way to reach so many teachers. It's an incredible scale of, of engagement for your time spent De deliver developing the program itself and I, I I wish we'd done more of it <laughs> um, in our case it's you know thinking about this before today um, asynchronous has a you know we really I just really made me realize how much I wish we'd worked on it more and also thought about why not and I guess I'll just just touch on that because you know every organization is different and and if this can help you kind of get moving for yourself or just think about what this looks like. I realized that for us, asynchronous, we largely don't do asynchronous programs just because of the way our organization is, is set up and our current priorities. If I am going to create an asynchronous program, it is a recorded program. And um, that for organization has a very different kind of uh approach than education programs which are live and you know just very customized as we go along and are based on something we've done in person um and are being adjusted with new content but if i were to create an asynchronous program it would include the i would have to involve the entire curatorial team we would of course be um looking at Indigenous consultation um, because we're involving Indigenous artifacts and it's a huge part of what we do when we're developing new uh, content um, to share and to create a recorded product, which we have done a bit of during the last couple of years, but it's an entirely different process than doing something live. And live for organization is just you know, whether it's, you know, a webinar for the public or whether it's, you know, for schools, it's a lot, um, a lighter or more flexible presentation offering and and it allows us to move more quickly and and move forward so just a kind of interesting it's not really a very a good reason you know when i think about it that we don't have uh as a lot of asynchronous content because i can see how incredibly useful that's been for teachers over the last little while um it also for me seemed like quite daunting like i don't have the same teacher background that christina does i have our you know our, our experiential programs in the museum to, to draw on and to uh you know kind of start from scratch with a whole like slide based program is just not so i guess all of this is just to say you know you may find you're more drawn to asynchronous or synchronous based on your why and who you're trying to reach but also what skill set you're bringing in what you already have to work with as well and what your site is like and and i think christine and i would both agree that the thing to do is to move forward with something that you can do right away and that fits with who you're trying to reach keeping it simple yeah thanks karen i think i think mm -hmm. it's a really good point that that where you put your energies is going to be very different depending on your organization and depending on the skills and background of the people who are working there. Um, and so this is certainly not a one size fits all. It's not the same um, outcome for everybody. And what is simple for one organization is more complex for another um, for many different reasons. Could I just share my little screen to, to show you what it looks like on our end? Because I just want to make sure we see kind of a, the gamut of, I just have a couple of slides to share. Just, just have a different kind of take. Um, is this it? Yes, it is. Okay. So you saw Christina set up with a laptop and, and the slides. Now our programs are all, we have no slides. Um, we do very little screen sharing, um, although we do do some. Um, we use a laptop in this one, and the reason I'm starting with this slide is because actually a laptop is what most people already have access to. And it's, I think, the easiest way to go for it. You can just like we're doing today. You know, everybody's zoomed their faces off at this point and basically you can do a zoom with your content that you want to share and you're good to go. You can screen share some images and, and that's really all you need. Um, we use a laptop in this context because it's the only time we're actually stationary for our programs and this is when we're doing a hands-on program um, whether it's on the right you can see jen is doing a paddle painting program on the left there's a soapstone carving program that's actually in her house during the pandemic but it was the only picture i had of that one 
Um, and we use a combination of a laptop and an overhead uh, webcam that I've just got stuck on a mic stand, but you can put it on anything. Uh, I saw that Christina had an overhead camera on her desk there. So you can just toggle in your Zoom window between your laptop camera and your overhead camera to get yourself a, a, you know, a bird's eye view of what your hands are doing. And we've found that amazing for live programming um, and did a lot of that last year. But this is what we mostly do, which is uh, we're in the galleries and there's none of me because I'm always the one taking the pictures, <laughs> although I'm actually the moose in the bottom middle there. I'm working that puppet and taking a picture at the same time. Um, and Jeremy, our curator, is doing a, a program there. But you'll see that our tech is it's a, a monopod or a tripod originally, an iPad and a light. And that is what we use for everything um it's uh this is what it looks like close up we started with freestanding lights but this has been what we've moved to it's very nimble and it's you know an ipad is expensive you could use any tablet um but that's and there's a range of how much this gear costs so this is very very accessible and i'll just say that this is where we've landed after a lot of experimentation despite a few drawbacks, because it's incredibly, um, I'm just gonna stop sharing. It's incredibly um, versatile. Um, I have it right here. Oh, it's not gonna work with my strange, <laughs> with my background. <laughs> it's gonna look too weird, I don't think. Yeah, okay, well, oh, look at that sort of. It's a monopod, it's an iPad, and it's basically like a giant selfie stick and you can lift it up, you can, hover it over your artifact super close up. You can walk around very carefully, not bouncing it around and you get the knack of that pretty quickly. Um, and the genius part of this monopod is that it has feet so it stands up by itself. Um, much easier not to kick it when you're walking than a tripod, although a tripod will also work. So we, this is where we've landed. And I bring this to you just because we, our priority, our our main goal was to be out in the galleries to share the collection because we felt that that's what we could offer that was most unique um, to uh, students around the world. Um, so we wanted to be out there in the galleries and we can't move those canoes around. They're <laughs> not very portable. So we uh, move around our spaces and the iPad allows us to do that best. Um, has a couple of downsides, hard to screen share. And you can't mic it if you use two people. You can't plug in an external mic and have two people delivering the program. But that's a sort of a small technical aside. Yeah. And we've landed there as the, the best way to do this. And I just want to say it's super, it's very accessible to do it this way. Yeah. Whereas when we started, our gallery mm -hmm. was under renovation. So I didn't have a gallery to move through. <laughs> so that's why you see that I am in a little studio. Mm -hmm. um, and normally I operate out of a studio, so I don't have issues of people walking in my shot or Zoom bombing or mm -hmm. interrupting uh, my coworkers or our guests while they are visiting the museum. Now mm -hmm. that we are open, the museum's open, come visit us. I'll be there. <laughs> I promise next week I will not have a cold. Um, and yeah. spare my germs. Mm -hmm. um, but we we used a different setup because it worked for us and because we started with asynchronous before we went to synchronous. So mm -hmm. you see the total opposite ends mm -hmm. um, where they started with a synchronous and now they're thinking, oh, maybe we should do the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And I started with the other stuff. I'm like, oh, I think I'll try it mm -hmm. uh, and have permission to to try with your friends class and, you know, make all the mistakes or I made all of my coworkers sit on a Zoom as I tried and played um, and, and practice on them because you're going to make mistakes and we have terrible Wi-Fi. So mm -hmm. I like to sit in one spot where I have very good Wi-Fi. Um, our outbuildings that I would love to explore don't. So play with it before you launch it. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really um, helpful to see the different kinds of setups that you've that you've chosen and for different reasons. I wonder if each of you could maybe very briefly just say, you know, if you do have some money, you get some grant money, for example, where's where do you spend that money for the most impact? I think particularly with synchronous programs. 
Mm -hmm. um, I would recommend having a laptop with a camera and a good mic. Mm -hmm. um, a Yeti mic is awesome. And a light. Lighting for me, I uh, will look dead and kids will ask you if you're sick. Not <laughs> like today where I actually am. Um, proper lighting for your artifacts. If you've got even more money, um, like a secondary screen or a second camera. I use an Okio cam. It was about a hundred bucks and it ties right into my, my laptop. These types of things make, for me, it easier. The, if you have even more money, if somebody gives you a good grant, <laughs> editing software um, and training how to use it. So I use Premiere Pro quite a bit and I use a lot of the Adobe Suite, uh, which is very useful for developing my asynchronous programs. Um, so having access to those. So uh, somebody said, what type of Yeti, a mic? I use a Yeti mic, a blue Yeti mic. It's awesome. I love it. And I use an Okio Cam document camera, which I got from my teacher friends. Uh, they said, use the Okio Cam because it's cheap and cheerful. And all teachers love cheap and cheerful. Um, and I am a tech idiot. So I found things that were really user-friendly and a ring light. I'm as vain as they come. I put on lipstick today for you people. So using a good camera, using good light and good sound. Kids will turn off the, the cameras if Wi-Fi is an issue. So if you sound good, that's half the battle. Then you become a podcast. Isn't it cool to be a podcast? Especially with Connected North too often, if there's storms or things like that, we say, if anything, the audio is more important uh, than the video. We do a lot of sessions with interactivity where people are showing something or doing a craft or doing an arts activity or beating. And so we tend to invest in higher end document cameras and we provided about 30 of our um, indigenous providers with document cameras. So I put the model there, it is a bit more expensive, but it has a light and zoom built in. And because of the amount of crafts and those activities that we're doing, that lets you basically be on a webcam and show a second screen where you might be, you know, doing a painting or beading or other activity. But yeah, I totally agree with Christina. And those Yeti mics is under $200, very reasonable given the quality. So those are excellent add-ons. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Uh, I would totally second Christina. We were actually very fortunate last year in that we did receive money to develop like a, more more money than you know has ever existed <laughs> for our virtual programs last year. Um, I mean, we started this program with an iPad and the tripod that I found in the like tech closet that was half broken already, you know, and we did that for like three years. Um, in this in the pivot to digital. There has been fit funding available now. So um, the gear that you're seeing is what I researched the heck out of to, to step it up after, you know, dealing with a shoestring for, for you know, four years. Um, and if you're going to go this iPad route, I cannot recommend this particular, oh, I can't show you, <laughs> so frustrating, uh, iFootage monopad monopod uh i maybe i'll i'll get i can write it up and get get married to send it but the gear that i chose this mountable ipad um case i mean they're still fairly low end um this is the gear that i chose and and love to bits i i mean this monopod doesn't look like much but it is my favorite piece of tech i've purchased in like a decade it's so brilliant you know these little design features but the thing i was going to second is yes the skills of premier uh adobe suite that was part of our uh funding last year and it depends again what you're doing but um we don't do as much i was creating more video and um, that's kind of what we do as asynchronous content is we're providing kind of video for a lot of different reasons. And that helped my capacity there in editing the video, but it will be very, very useful in developing asynchronous content um, going forward, having those, those skills. And, you know, yeah, you can jump on iMovie and like pull it together and you feel like every kids today can just do it like that. But to do it well it does take some time and, and investment in the software so I, I would i would second that if you think you're going to be creating any video content yeah if you're in it for the long haul like you can mm -hmm. start with adobe rush which is a much 
cheaper, I think, mm -hmm. free version. Mm -hmm. So there's Rush, and then you can move to Premiere Pro. Um, I s recommend a second screen. I love a second screen. I will yes, never go back. <laughs> Thank you to whoever curator that gave me a second screen and that I stole from IT. Um, second screens are great. If you are really getting into this, you can also get a 360 camera. We share one with a sister museum and we use a Theta cam for all of our 360 virtual tours. So like, if you wanna go take a tour of one of our outbuildings, please go to the OM Museum website, take a look at the 360s. It's just a monopod, it's a Theta cam, it's about 500 bucks to $1,000. Um, and you could use a Matterport. So Matterport is a residential software for creating doll houses to, to sell real estate. And we've co-opted it for museums. Um, and we have a sister organization, uh, Judith and Norman Alex Art Gallery that uses it as well. Um, and this is really some amazing cutting edge technology that you can get into on the ground floor for creating walkthrough exhibits. So if you are a rural site and you really are hoping to, to up your game and you're not so worried about like, there for our outbuildings, you wanna see my new gallery, you come in person and you pay my admission. Uh, but for other things, you can tour our, our stuff and it creates accessibility, especially for those that have anxieties about visiting spots or for the first time, you can, you can take like a sneak tour first. Um, so there's some other re really cool tech if you get a, a super grant. Um, we use 3D Vista for our virtual tour that I developed last year. Um, we don't have a camera. We actually just hired somebody to do that part. But um, I recommend this software, 3D Vista, and that is a one-time purchase of around $360, not cheap, but then you have it forever. Um, the very cool thing that I'm looking forward to doing with our virtual tours, which I haven't done yet, the 360s is with that program, you can create layers or skins as they call them so that you can basically gamify your, like, uh, your virtual tour and create education specific or even grade specific experiences going through your virtual tour as well as or live, breakout rooms live or, guide your virtual tour. So some very cool opportunities there with 360s that are a bit beyond the sort of let's look at this person's living room, you know, online that we are used to seeing our Google Street View. There's some cool educational op opportunities for sure. Great. I think um, sort of skipping a bit ahead in our outline and to address some of the questions that have come in on the Q&A mm -hmm. um, about monetization. Um, and I guess there's, there's, there's also some other questions just kind of about demand and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll touch on monetization first and then we can talk about what you've seen in terms of demand. But I wonder if I can ask Christina, if you could talk a little bit about monetization potential in terms of asynchronous programs and then Karen, you can talk about how you've approached monetization for, for synchronous. So currently the Oil Museum of Canada offers its asynchronous programs for free. We are part of Cultural Services Lambton, which also includes the libraries. So as part of that, we offer them for free currently. However, before I did all the research and as a teacher, I remember paying for programs. So where did I go when I bought programs? You can go to Teachers Pay Teachers. So Teachers Pay Teachers is a website where teachers can load content, worksheets, rubrics, slide decks and they will pay for them um, and it's normally a 50 50 split or a 60 40 split um, you put a program out you post it at five or ten dollars a teacher will pay for it they get a digital copy of it and you get five bucks or you get 250 depending on what you price the program or your worksheets at or whatever you price it and it is available all around the world uh, on Teachers Pay Teachers. You can also think about uh, subscriptions. So you may have an education subscription. So you pay yearly for a subscription and that gets you access to the catalog or you can use paywalls. Uh, if you have somebody techie within your organization, you can create this, you can put a thumbnail of your program, some really hooky descriptions and you can then have it a paywall. So then you would, uh, you would pay for access or you could sell your passwords. So you can password protect it and sell your passwords to get access to that content. Um, these are really 
different ways. Now keep in mind, teachers are cheap, so you have to create a very valuable content and understand that educators, because of this, if they buy a password, they're gonna share it with everybody in their department um, to try and get your content. And with a subscription or something like this, you need to be generating new content so that they'll pay for that subscription or pay for that access next year. So if you've created content, how are they going to keep enrolling and purchasing this content year after year? So you will have to generate that new content. However, if you're looking to generate some revenue on that end, that is the way that I would go about doing it, is creating some teacher subscriptions, paywalls, or putting it on Teachers Pay Teachers, um, which is an intermediary website that all teachers use. Um, and you can sell it at the professional organizations. So if you end up going to a Hastas conference or OG conference or an ETFO conference, you can sell it to teachers there. They love buying stuff at conferences um, or you can sell it to your board. Mm -hmm. So make friends with those subject specializations and you sell the package to the board. Um, and school boards have an incentive to put local content in local schools. Uh, they wanna see that it's proven and that it meets all their requirements. So you work with them to create that type of package. Um, we do know a lot of environmental organizations in our community, such as St. Clair um, Conservation Authority that's done that as well. Uh, but for remote or rural schools, they might not have the funding. So sponsorship. Um, I'm still looking for sponsors. If you know any friendly oil companies, I'm an oil museum. Or if you have any friendly environmental people, I like to talk about the environment too. Um, so you can you can always go that route as well for, for revenue generation. Great, thanks. And um, so Karen, just in, in, in talking about your um, uh, synchronous programs, I wonder if you could could address sort of how, how you, you went about sort of deciding how and what to charge as well, because we've had some questions about where, how does it compare, for example, to your, to your in-person program? Yeah, um, our, I mean, when we started out, we offered this at no cost to participants. We started out with, um, it was supported by an annual appeal dedicated to starting our virtual programs. And we did, it was sort of donor or foundation supported for a couple of years and we offered it at no cost. Um, we do charge for our in-person programs. Um, the high end of what's available in town, actually, it's $14 per visit day for a full day of programming. Um, and so that's kind of where we were at until the, until the pandemic. And um, then coming into the end of 2020, when we started offering virtual programs again, mid-2020, um, we started at four. I basically looked around at what was being offered, knowing that we couldn't really, well, I wasn't really being, was not encouraged to do it for free by my organization. Um, and I looked at what else was being charged by the McMichael, by other sort of, you know, similar uh, level of organizations. Um, started off with a $4 per student uh, charge with a minimum of 15 students. Um, and that became, well, kind of unsustainable. There were a lot of small classes. Um, I, was, I was trying to buddy them up. Um, it ended up being quite a administrative uh, brouhaha because they're like, oh, and actually only 17 came. And then you're like, change it. Like it just became too much. So um, we moved kind of felt very draconian. It really did and still does. We just said it's 150 flat rate. It made it faster for our minute, you know, the person generating the invoices. I didn't have to go back and forth about how many exact students there are. So it really simplified that. Um, I think that Michael also went that route, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I had done a little looking around. I mean, there's a whole bunch of organizations offering programs for free, uh, you know, and they can do that. And honestly, if I could, I mean, I am honestly pushing at my organization to move back to at least subsidized. Um, I the number of teachers who pay 
out of pocket, especially during the pandemic when they didn't, if they were in a virtual school, they didn't even have a budget and they were paying with their own money. Like it made me feel ill, you know, and teachers generally don't have much of a budget, especially for virtual programs. Um, so I am, and I do see it creating a barrier. Um, I have kind of yeah, just turned away from that right now, <laughs> but since we're actually just coming to the end of our virtual programs before we close down for our move to the new museum, like next month. So I'm not trying to fix that right now, but going forward, I'm really uncomfortable with the lack of access. In our case, we just barely had any availability. And the fact that a bunch of people couldn't come just meant I wasn't turning down as many people. That's not an acceptable way for me to move forward. Um, so yes, we charge 150 bucks and many a lot of schools don't bat an eye honestly they're especially if they've come before honestly like the, it's a they're like it was amazing they're happy if they've got a school budget they don't they don't find that a too much but then there's just some schools that's impossible for um and i don't want to close them out i think it would be better to go with a sponsored or a, a donor funded program and i hope to go with that in the future to at least offset some of the cost to schools. And I think as we move out of, I think there's going to be a continued appetite for virtual programs, especially um, when schools can't afford busing um, and or have other light barriers to actually coming. Um, but I don't think that there's going to be like an increased budget for it. You know, it's I think that there's still going to be that that financial pressure and yeah. I don't think virtual is going away because we do have barriers to accessing our sites. Our sites are expensive. Buses are over $500. So virtual programming meets those needs in a much more accessible way. 90% um, of all my virtual programs are from outside Lambton County. They're from Ottawa Carleton or TDSB or Waterloo or Hamilton Wentworth. Um, very few of them are actually local so that we are delivering this content in people that physically can't visit us mm -hmm. uh, due to distance and this is one of the beautiful things of virtual is that you can access a huge audience um, beauty part my programs are free so i get paid mm -hmm. in clicks mm -hmm. um, so that's how i i understand it and it and it meets the mandate of our of our site mm -hmm. I, I realize we're we're getting very close to our to our scheduled end time and we haven't nearly covered everything that we wanted to talk about today and we still have some outstanding questions but I wanted to just as we wrap up um, ask each of our presenters to just share um, one sort of promising practice that they that they have 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 seen or used that makes for a successful and sustainable virtual program. And I'm gonna ask Michael to go first because I think he might have to jump off shortly. Um, but uh, yeah, what's what's one last thing that you want to leave us with, Michael? Hard to pick one. I know we started by talking about land acknowledgement, so I think that's covered uh, in the link I shared. But one of the key ones, especially given, and there was a question in the chat about, you know, will this last forever? I think for the schools that, that we are serving through Connected North, you know, virtual field trips will be the only way that they can engage with your institutions. And so I think one of the key things that we've seen um, be essential is facilitating interactivity, you know, building interactivity in um, as much as possible in any age group. And we have some resources on that that we're just polishing up. So hopefully we can look at how we could share them through Mary and the OMA. But I would say yeah, thinking of ways that you can incorporate interactivity and there's lots of tools and, and uh, strategies to do that in some way. So student interactivity will be my takeaway. Thank you, Michael. Um, Karen? Yeah, I would, I would, we didn't really talk a lot about content today and, and sort of approach to doing this. And I think Christina will probably follow up on that with other webinars as well. But yes, absolutely. I would, I would second the interactivity, um, physical movement, uh, getting the kids to move around, especially the younger kids while they're, they're, um, you know, um, you know, we get them up paddling, we have them singing Voyager song. We, like, it's like, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, they paddle around the museum with us and you learn to hold paddles that, you know, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, and having many handling items you can bring up, inviting a lot of back and forth and 
story sharing um, and direct connection um, with the with with the content. Um, one thing that we're exploring that I feel strongly about is uh, in our case when like right now our team is is me <laughs> and uh, and I know Christine is the only person delivering programs there um, and I have Jen on a part-time basis working with me we don't have indigenous animators on staff right now um, so we are presenting this without you know without an indigenous presenter um, and one thing that we're working on is incorporating Indigenous voices into our programs so that working with our communities um, that we have relationships with around our artifacts. Um, I've been interviewing and gathering some quotes um, and video content that we can flip to during our programs. Um, we're actually keeping it largely just for, I mean, we have video quotes about our artifacts that we can jump to um but we don't sometimes the connection isn't strong enough to support a video feed so we actually have a have versions there of the uh, indigenous voices uh, just on screen as a as an image that we're also experimenting with anyway this is just to say that uh we're looking at how to include more voices in our programs which i feel is really important uh so about useful practices don't be afraid to try it. Um, I think a lot of what I got from some of, uh, of the feedback is it's okay to be silly. It's okay to make mistakes. It is okay to put a product out there that is a work in progress because as you go through this, your skills will improve. You'll figure out new ways. You can add new layers to existing programs. You can take what your site is good at. I'm an oil museum. We're good at oil, we're good at science, good at geography. Take what you are good at and really run with it. What makes your uniqueness and then play with it. You have my permission. You can tell, you can tell everybody. Christina from the oil museum said, I love getting in trouble. So um, my curator might be listening. So yes, I love getting in trouble. Um, said, I'm allowed to play. I'm allowed to try. And I'm allowed to be a little bit silly. You're, you're talking to young people. <laughs> you know, try that. Keep in mind, though, you are talking to young people. So some of the jokes we say to entertain ourselves after we've done a program for 30 or 40 times, maybe don't do those. Um, so really try, experiment, put a product out there that's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect quite yet because you're gonna do what I do and I'm trashing my first program and redoing it and I'm excited. Mm -hmm. I have all these great ideas for how to take an old program that's virtual and rebuild it to something what I want now. And it's okay to start where you are. And if you have any questions, pick up the phone and call me down at the oil museum. I love chatting mm -hmm. when I don't have a cold. <laughs> Great, thank you. Well, um, we are just about at the end of our time, running a little bit over time even. And I really wanna thank all of our speakers, Christina, Karen, and Michael today for sharing all of your experiences. You've had a, a ton of, of different experiences and, and perspectives to share. So I really do appreciate you um, coming together today, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, and, and sharing with the members. Um, and, um, I wanna thank everybody who signed in to participate today. Um, the recording of the webinar um, and the worksheet um, will all be distributed and posted on the OMA's website after um, uh, later this week. And as I mentioned, we are doing a couple of follow-up sessions with Christina to get really a bit more down into the nitty gritty of the how-to both in asynchronous and synchronous programming. So I know there were some questions that we didn't get to and I really hope that we'll be able to address those um, in those follow-up sessions or by providing some additional information um, online at a later date. And we'll be sending out registration information for those sessions with um, all of the recording and follow-up information as well. Um, when you leave the webinar, you will be, as always, directed to an evaluation form, evaluation form. And we really do appreciate your feedback about this session, about what you want to see more of in the future. Um, if there's any other potential webinar topics specifically within the Small Bite series that you would like to see. 
Um, and once again, thank you, of course, to the Government of Canada for funding the Small Bites Initiative. And thank you, everybody, for your participation today. Um, and we'll see you again soon.